We are in Romans chapter 8. We're going to be in chapter 8 for a while. And much of what in Romans chapter 8 is basically God giving us assurance of our salvation. That we know we're saved. It's in Romans 8. It's there. And he has given us this assurance by giving us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads us. It says in verse 14, where we have spent a couple of weeks there uh, last time before last week. Verse 14, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. God has given us his Spirit and led us to be his children. Only those who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. None other. And the scriptures teach that those are the only people who are sons of God are those who believe in his son, who look to him and call on him and trust him and follow him. Those people, only they are the sons of God. There are no others except them. It says in Galatians 3, 26 and 27, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Through faith in Jesus, you are sons of God. That's the only way you qualify to be one of his children. Only those who believe in him are sons of God. Now I want to chase a really quick rabbit sort of as an introduction, sort of in a way, to, before I get into some uh, the meaty stuff of the text today. The entire theme of us being sons of God, the entire theme in the scripture of us being his children is an awesome theme. We spent the whole sermon the last time talking about this. Verse 14, sons of God. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God, children of God. There is so much that we did not uncover. It's so deep, so rich. And I don't know if this really has anything to do with it, but the only way we become children of God by faith in Jesus Christ is by being like children. We are children so we come like children. Jesus said it in Matthew 18 this way. Um, in fact, this is the only status update of a, of a believer, the characteristic of a believer, like a child. He not only saved us and made us his children, but we have the characteristics of children. Verse 18, or chapter 18, verse 4. Verse 2, whew, verses 2 through 4. He called a little child and had him stand among them, and he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The only way you're going to get into the kingdom of heaven is coming to him like a little child. And what are the characteristics of a little child? It could mean several things, but it's simple things like this. Children are unpretentious. They're not there to prove anything. They're just there to be with you. They're simple. They're obedient. They have a need to trust and rely. The emphasis of that passage is on humility. The disciples are arguing about who's the greatest. He brings a little child and says, here's the greatest. A little child, humble little child, nothing. Little children have no concern for social status. They're not trying to prove that they're better than anybody else. Just little children. And they trust God and humbly come to him, believing that he prom what he promised he's going to do, he will do. That's what little children are like. And that is the characteristic of those who are believers in Jesus Christ. Those who are children of God are children of God. Those who are sons of God are children. The Spirit leads us to become like this. This is not natural to us. We're not born this way. We're not born a child of God. The Spirit came to us and drew us to Christ. The Spirit opened our eyes and brought us to be this like this little child, humble and unpretentious. Trusting, obedient, simple. That is the direction of our lives. Following Jesus Christ as a child. Now none of us do that perfectly. We fail way too much. All the time. But that is our direction. And that in itself, by itself, all alone, that one characteristic is assurance of our salvation. You follow Christ like a little child. You follow Christ like a humble child. That's shows me, shows you that you're saved. Just being a child. And we could just keep going and going and going on and on about this one thing. The Spirit leads us to reflect the character of God. The Spirit leads us to um, be like the Father. 
The Spirit leads us to bear spiritual fruit. The Spirit leads us to put to death the misdeeds of the body. That was verse 13. Those are things that the Spirit does in us. The Spirit gives us this assurance by making these things live in us. Characteristics of children of God. That's what we are. But I want to keep going and try to see how far we can get today in the next few verses. I, I'm under a great deal of pressure, and not from you, but from me. And you all know my struggle. I struggle with this every day, every week we study, every week we, get, we come together to talk. It really is overwhelming. One of my uh, preaching heroes, at least for the book of Romans, is Martin Lloyd-Jones. He preached four verses on verse 14 or four sermons on verse 14. He preached seven verses on verse 15. He preached eight verses or eight sermons on verse 16 and three more sermons on verse 17. The section we're in now. In his commentary, which is the best commentary you can get on Romans, it's 290 pages, just those four verses. There's no way I can read all that and make one sermon for you. There's no way. So I know I'm going to leave something out on my study here. But let's see where we can get with it. Paul says in verse 15, You did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received a spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. First thing to notice in that verse, you have this word spirit used twice. Now in the NIV it's translated spirit with a lowercase s, and the second time it's translated spirit with a, Uppercase, uh, uh, uppercase, Holy Spirit. And that causes us to have to figure out why they do it that way because in Greek there are no capital letters like, uh, unless it's a pronoun, they don't capitalize it. So both are, in the Greek text, both are sm lowercase. So how do you translate it? What do you say? What does it mean? The word can either refer to two, uh, either your, the Holy Spirit himself or to the human spirit or your disposition or your feelings, your human spirit. And that leaves me with three possible interpretations and I'm going to rush through them as quickly as I can. First one is that spirit means human spirit both times. A person's disposition or a person's feelings, the way a person thinks in his soul. That would mean this. Very simple interpretation. We used to be fearful, but now that we are saved, now that we have been brought into a conversion experience with Jesus Christ, we have now a cheerful spirit of adoption by which we call God Father. We used to be afraid, and now we're not. Well, I don't disagree with that interpretation one bit. I think that's totally true. But I don't think that's what that text means. It's a good interpretation, and it is true, not what Paul means here. Yet the other interpretation is both times the word refers to the Holy Spirit, both times. Martin Lloyd-Jones believes this one. It's the Holy Spirit, and his, his interpretation is the Holy Spirit brings conviction of sin, which makes you afraid. And the second time, the Holy Spirit brings freedom in the gospel, which makes you not afraid. And that's a good interpretation too. I like that one a lot. Except my struggle with this one is, he takes so many pages to explain that, I would have never figured it out in a million years. Whenever it's so complicated that you have to be a genius to figure it out, I'm not sure I'm good enough to get it. So I automatically want to go, I don't, I'm not, I'm just, I don't get it, I'm not smart enough. Plus, there are other geniuses who hold the same view that the Holy Spirit means, that the word Spirit means Holy Spirit both times, but then they have a different interpretation of Martin Lloyd-Jones. And they're my heroes too. So you start going, oh mercy, uh, this is just confusing to me. It's so complicated, so I don't see it. Now I don't disagree that that's true. The Holy Spirit convicted us of our sin and brought us to fear, and the Holy Spirit came and gave us relief, just like the song. But I don't think that's what it means in the text. So I believe that the first time, Spirit refers to human disposition, human feelings, the soul of the man, the soul of the woman, the, what's going on on the inside, your spirit. And the second time, it means the Holy Spirit. In fact, that's the way the NIV translates it. That's the way the English Standard Version translates it. And most of your trans translations translate it that way. And 
Add that to the parallel text in Galatians where Paul says virtually the same thing that he says in Romans 8 here in uh, Galatians 4, um, talking about the law. He says, verse 3 through 6, So also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights as sons. That word, full rights as sons, is the Greek word adoption. Same thing he's talking about in Romans 8. Because you are sons, God sent his spirit, the spirit of his son, into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Same thing as in Romans 8. So if I took those two passages together, those two texts together, and then make an interpretation, I come up with this idea. The Holy Spirit gives us sonship. He gives us adoption. He comes to us and gives us this. And the slavery to fear that we have in Romans 8.15, you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. That fear is the fear of what the law has placed on us. And the law places this burden on us, the only way you're ever going to be satisfactory to God is if you obey every single thing the law says. And if you fail, you're condemned. You are now under his wrath and under his judgment, and you will never escape. The law did that to you. Now, I don't know about you, but that scares me. Because we know... Back in verse 7 and 8 of Romans 8, you will not submit to God's law and you cannot submit to God's law because the natural man, the man without the spirit, the man who is just in the flesh, that's what we are. So we can't submit to God's law, we won't submit to God's law. So the law brings fear among us. The reality that you're under God's wrath, that you will die and face his judgment, it is a slavish and anxious apprehension of punishment. That's fear. That's real fear. In fact, that's a, a, the kind of fear you ought to have so that you will come to Christ. That's what the law does. Brings you to that place where you know you're going to be judged and only Christ can save you from it. Now, if you're afraid, guess what that does to any potential relationship you might have with God? What? Ruins it. There's no way to have a proper and pleasant, tender and joyful relationship with God when you're afraid of him. No, I don't mean like holy fear. I mean, you're just terrified to go into his presence. You're terrified to come before him and ask him for anything or to talk to him about anything because you're afraid. What kind of relationship is that? non-existent virtually the only kind of relationship that is one where you come cowering the whole time and you have to hate this when you want to come to God for something whatever it is you want to ask God for something but you can't ask him because you're afraid of him is that a good relationship is that the kind of relationship we ought to be having with the living God no I assure you it is not if that's how you are, you may need to check your understanding of the gospel. If you're afraid to have a relationship with the living God, do you even know the gospel of Jesus Christ who died to take away God's wrath? Because the gospel, in the gospel, by the gospel, the Spirit comes and gives us this privilege Excuse me. All the privileges of sonship. All the privileges of adoption. All the privileges of being a child. The Spirit gives that to us. And because the Spirit comes and gives that to us, we're not afraid. You don't ever have to go before God afraid. We don't have the fear anymore. Our relationship with God is not one where we're afraid to approach him or we'll die if we ask anything. There's, there's no more terror because of our sin anymore when we come to God. Our sin has been taken away. Our sin is gone. All 
of them. No more fear. Sin is gone. This is what the writer of Hebrews talks about in chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. He says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too, talking about Christ, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, the gospel on the cross, by his death on the cross, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. That's our salvation. That's our salvation. Christ became one of us so he could die for us and take away the fear of death, take away the fear of judgment, take away the fear that the law put on us. That's our gospel message. The writer of Hebrews also, chapter 12, says it this way, verse 18 through 24, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, to gloom and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word would be spoken to them. You didn't come to the mountain Sinai where the law is there and if you touch it, you will die and you're terrified of it. You didn't come to that mountain because they could not bear what was commanded. Quote, if even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. We didn't come to that. But you have come to Mount Zion to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. To the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect. The one who makes you perfect, the one who makes you righteous, the one who declares you righteous, who gives you Christ's righteousness, you've come to him. Now clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, the one who stands before God and intercedes for you. That's who you've come to. And I'll I'll promise you this, whenever he asks God the Father to do something for you, it gets done. And if he says, Father, those are my people, don't judge them, you will never be judged. You have come to him, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. The blood of Christ shed on the cross cleans you totally. That's... That's the gospel we've come to. We've come to Jesus Christ. We didn't come to the law. We didn't come to Mount Sinai. We didn't come for fear. We don't have any fear anymore in Christ Jesus because the Spirit has come to us. We don't have that fear. God is not going to get us if we show up to ask him for something. You know why? Or you know why not? We will not be judged while he won't. Condemn us if we show up asking for something or whatever we want to come to him for. You know why we won't be condemned? Why? Because verse 15 says, You have received instead the spirit of sonship, the spirit of adoption. You have received an adoption by the spirit. We have, we are adopted The Holy Spirit that adopts us, we have received him. The Holy Spirit has come and made us have have a new status. We are now in the family of God. We are now children of God. It's amazing. It's awesome. I'm I'm reluctant because I don't know how to preach this the right way. Our culture, I do not think, understands adoption the way Paul meant it in Romans. Romans. Or in Galatians. Because we, uh, Don posted a cool video. A little girl was getting adopted. She's crying. I'm crying. It's beautiful. I'm getting adopted? Oh, wow. And they're kissing on her as sweet as it could be. But see, we think of adoption as sort of a way of having pity and showing mercy and doing something sweet for someone. Now, it's got love in it, not trying to d- take it away. It's all loving. But that's really not the way Paul meant it in the New Testament. 
See, we, we, we adopt children because we can't have children in the regular way or we just feel sorry for them and so we adopt them out of pity and out of mercy so they don't have a horrible life. They can live with us and it's going to be great at our house, right? But the, but the text, when, you, when Paul says adoption, he means adoption with all the rights of a son. Adoption with all the privileges of the son. Not just so you don't have a horrible life, but so you get everything. The word adoption is only used five times in the New Testament. Three of them are in the book of Romans. It doesn't even occur in the Old Testament at all. In fact, it. It wasn't a very common practice among the Jews anyway. There were some episodes in the Old Testament where I guess you could say it was an adoption, but it doesn't say it that way, not directly. Like uh, uh, Pharaoh's uh, daughter adopted Moses, stuff like that. But it doesn't say it that way in the text. The Greek word technically means to have an installation or placement as a son, to formally and legally declare that someone who is not one's own child is from now on to be treated and cared for as one's own child, including the rights of an inheritance. In fact, that was the reason they adopted you, so you could get stuff, all the stuff, everything. A person is taken from one family or no family and placed into another family. And in the context of salvation, that God has removed us persons, uh, the, us persons from the family of Adam and put us into the family of his son. We have been adopted as children of God into his family with his son and we are no longer in the family of Adam. That's the context of salvation. The words of Ephesians 1, 5, and he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. There's one of the uses. Another one is we read this one already, Galatians 4. We were children. We were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights as sons. That's how the NIV translated that word adoption full rights as sons the idea is really foreign to us because we don't see adoption as a as an honor that's the way the romans meant for it to be the adopted son was often honored more than the natural children if you got adopted you got more stuff than the kids that were born with them you got more honor. It was an act of honor to be adopted. It made you, made you really high up on the social scale if you were adopted in Roman culture. Julius Caesar was adopted. Octavian, his grandnephew, later Emperor Augustus, he was adopted. Julius Caesar adopted him, called him his son and his heir. I mean, that's so big time that the emperor said, this guy's going to be the emperor because I adopted him as my own son. He's really my grandnephew. But no, he's my son now, and he gets to be emperor. Now, you and I are stuck with the family that we're born in. Nothing you can do about it. You got what you got. It's in the DNA. Your mom and dad played biology games, and you're here. Nothing you can do. But if you're adopted, you were chosen. If you were adopted, you were chosen, and that's a, no, a, a noble thing, a grand thing. Not just, hey, oh, we're going to have a baby. No, let's go, adopt a, let's go adopt a son so he can inherit everything. The son was adopted deliberately, deliberately chosen by a family, to preserve that family name and to inherit that family estate. That's the reason for adoption in the Roman world. And it's complicated and it's technical. It's got a lot of meat to it, and I'm not going to get into all the technical stuff. But basically, when a Roman family adopted you, you're honored more than their normal natural children. In fact, you have first dibs on the inheritance before the natural children. 
That's the Roman culture of adoption. That's what Paul means when he says adoption. And when it's, when it's talking about our salvation, it means that God chose us when we had nothing and we were nothing and we were going to never contribute anything to his kingdom or anything of our own to make him glorious or anything. It was all him and he did it. He chose us and brought us to himself and gave us the inheritance, everything. And that's next week's sermon too because I won't get to verse eight, 17 today. God took someone who is not a natural child and made them the heir of the estate. We are sons, we are children, because God adopted us into his family. You're his son, you're his daughter, you're his child, you are his. You're in the family. And you get everything because you're in the family. He chose you to be adopted. He predestined you to be adopted. That's what the text says. We are made his children through adoption, and he gives us everything. Now, I want to tell you this, too. The opposite of fear happens when you're adopted. The opposite of fear we didn't receive a spirit again, of slavery to fear again. We received the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who brought us into an adoption relationship with the Father. And we're not afraid anymore. We don't cower in terror that we don't belong to God anymore. We don't have a total breakdown and meltdown because we try to come to Him with something. Instead, what? Verse 15, by Him we cry, Abba, Father. I want to camp on this for a second. This is beautiful. Very sweet. This is very sweet because this one phrase right here, by him we cry, Abba, Father, is a great assurance of your salvation. You want to know if you're saved? You want to know if you're really one of the children of God? Do this. In fact, you already do it. You do it automatically. It's because you're a child, because you're adopted, this is what you do. You cry, Abba, Father. The Holy Spirit regenerated us. The Holy Spirit opened our eyes to show us the death of Christ was for our sins. The Holy Spirit showed us that the death of Christ satisfied God's judgment and his righteous wrath against us. The Holy Spirit showed us all that. The Holy Spirit lives in us and dwells in us. And by living in us, he leads us to this intimate and tender communion and prayer with God as Father. Same thing, Galatians 4. We read it already. Because you are sons, because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. This word, uh, Abba, it's an Aramaic word. Paul used the Aramaic word in the Greek text, but he also used the Greek word because the word in Abba in Aramaic is translated Father. He uses both words there, Abba, Father. But he uses the word Abba to emphasize something. I believe it's critical that you, you get this. It emphasizes that it's a tender, sweet, special intimacy, a dependence, a complete lack of fear and anxiety when you come to God. Abba, that's the word. It's the word used by children when they speak familiar, familiar little, with familiarity. When they're that close to their dad, when they're that close to their father, that's what they call him, Abba. Just like Matthew 18, just like little children. You see this little child, unless you receive the kingdom like one of these little children, you'll never enter the kingdom. You know, what, you know what those little children do? You know what they call their dad? You know what weirds people out whenever they hear a kid, a little kid say to their dad, Father. Which kid does that? Does anyone know a, a child that says, Father? No. What do they call their dad? Daddy. Papa. The Aramaic word is Abba. That's what they say. Abba is a little child's word of the most intimate endearment, 
Daddy, hold me. Daddy, play with me. Daddy, um, help me. Daddy, catch me. Daddy, uh, can I have something? Daddy, it's always daddy, daddy, daddy. And when daddy comes home from work, they just go jump on him. If, you're, if the daddy is on the floor beside the couch and the little kid is on the top of the couch, he's going to jump off that couch and land right on his dad and have fun doing it. And the dad's going to go, oh. If you're a dad, you know, what, you know what I'm talking about. And you love it. Daddy, watch. Daddy. That's what kids do. That's what little children do. It's the common instinctive word for little children who talk to their fathers. It's like it when you see a movie where the kids are raised in like a military type, type family and they all come in regimented, father, it weirds you out. He's like, what's wrong with these people? I want some little kid to come jump on his dad and go, daddy. That's what this means. That's exactly what Paul means. Daddy. Jesus used this word, Mark 14, 36, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus used this word, Abba, Father. Now this tells me a couple of things. One is this explains to me how deep the emotional attachment was, the deep, how deep the emotional relationship Jesus had with his father that he is getting ready to die tomorrow on the cross and he's calling out to his father not father if it's your will he's like daddy father abba ah! and it also shows me the agony he was experiencing that night sweating drops of blood knowing that tomorrow he's going to endure the wrath of his father for sinners abba abba father speaks volumes right there father abba i've got to take your wrath upon me if there's any way to let this go away please let it but not what i will but what you will father Abba. And I think, I believe it in the same way, the same way, not because we have to endure God's wrath, but in the very same way, the Spirit causes us to cry out. That's what the word means, cry out. The Spirit works in us to cry, to cry, to cry. The word means to shout. To scream even. A deep, emotional, heartfelt, desperate, affectionate cry. Father, Abba, Daddy, help me. I'm coming unglued. I can't make it. I'm going to fall apart here. Save me. Daddy. That's what Paul means. That's exactly what he means. The Spirit calls you to cry out. You cry out. You have a relationship with God as Father, and you know it. Not a formal, not a regimented, not a cold, not a mechanical way. Father, I have to go through these steps to go and tell him my request so he can help me. It's just like a little kid crying out, Daddy, help me. Daddy, catch me. That's our relationship with God now. Because of the Holy Spirit. He gave us the spirit of adoption that cries, Abba, Father. Now, I don't, I'm not trying to say we should be flippant or casual or irreverent. I believe every true adopted child of God knows that's not the way you're supposed to be. But every true child of God knows that he is your father and you can go to him because he is very familiar to you and you are familiar to him and you can go sit on his lap. You can do anything you want to in his presence because you're a son. You're a child. Adopted with all the privileges of a child. You get everything. Just go and cry, Abba, Father. He makes you cry out. And I just have to ask, is that your pattern? I mean, is that the way you pray? 
Because I think that's the way you should be praying if you're saved. Because that's what the Spirit does. He just makes you cry out. Daddy, I'm here. I've got nothing to bring. I just need you to hold me. That's a great assurance. That's, that's, an, that's incredible assurance. And you know it's true because if you believe in Jesus Christ, that's exactly what you do. Anybody here? Tell me you don't. Tell me you don't cry out, Abba, Father. And I'll assure you, if you have the Holy Spirit, you do. And if you do, you're saved. You're a child. Because children call out, Abba, Father. That's what you're doing. Great assurance. You want to hear another one? Verse 16. Wow. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Here we move into something that's a little bit more subjective. That means I can't prove it to you. Uh, I don't have any objective truth to give you. It's, it's not something that I can say is true whether you understand it or not because it's a subjective truth. This is true. You're saved. This is true. You're a child of God. This is true because you experience it. And I can't prove that, but you experience it. This is experimental truth. You just know it. How do you know you're a child of God? The Holy Spirit told me. Now I sound like a heretic when I say stuff like that. Because a lot of heretics say the Holy Spirit told me stuff that he didn't tell them. But I know this because the text says it. The Spirit bears witness. The Spirit testifies with our spirit that we're children of God. He told me I'm his. You just know it. The Spirit himself tells you. That's the way Paul says it. The Spirit does it. The word testifies is a word that means to provide confirming evidence by means of a testimony, to support by testimony, to provide supporting evidence, to testify in support of the facts, to confirm the facts. The Spirit comes and testifies to my spirit. These are the facts, Mike. You're a child of God. That's what Paul says. The Holy Spirit has come to us. Now, in case you think I'm trying to be too mystical here, I want to just prove to you that the Holy Spirit works this way all the time. There was a day when you were lost, you did not know Christ, you did not know the cross, you did not know anything. And God, by, his, by the Spirit's unknown power to us, power that we have no idea of understanding what it means, revealed to us, our sinfulness. One day, I was as happy as I could be being a sinner. The next day, it was killing me. How did that happen? How did all of a sudden, the, God showed me how sinful I am, and that I'm going to be judged, and I'm under doom for it? That bothered me. How did that happen? I'll tell you how it happened. The Holy Spirit did it. You think I can explain that to you? Not in a million years. He opened our eyes not just to give us the knowledge of the facts, but the reality of what Jesus' death really means. When Jesus died on the cross, the Holy Spirit's the one that showed you that that death was to take away God's wrath, to satisfy God's judgment, so that you wouldn't have to bear it. The Spirit revealed that to you. You would have never figured that out in a million years. Neither would I. Can you explain that? I can't. And the Spirit by a powerful influence. And I don't even know what that means. Powerful influence persuaded us, drew us, showed us Christ, and drew us to Him so that we placed our faith in Him and trusted Him. The Spirit did that. I can't explain that in a million years. Can you? How did you go from being an unbeliever to being a believer? How? The Spirit did it. 
And I'll say, in just the same way I can't explain that, I can't explain this. The Holy Spirit tells us, bears witness with us, testifies to us, to our souls, to our spirits, words of precious, deep assurance of our salvation. The Spirit does it. You know how I know? You know how I know? He told me. He showed me. I don't know another way. He says, you're mine. He says, I have you. He says, you're God's child. He says, you belong to him. He says, you're in God's family. He says, you're saved. You're one of us. You will never be condemned. And he confirms it, Paul says, with our spirit. And like I said, I don't want to get mystical because I know people who have no doubt whatsoever that they're saved, and I don't believe they're really saved. There's a lot of such a thing as false assurance. And there's also assurance that you get because the Spirit is working in your life to change you too. Second Peter chapter 2, or chapter 1, add to your faith goodness, those things. If you do these things, you will never be uncertain. Putting to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. The Spirit does that. But here we're talking about just the subjective reality that the spirit is talking to you testifying to you in your spirit you're saved he confirms your status as a child of God directly to your heart I think that's what Paul means here in chapter 8 that's what Paul means in other places too 2 Corinthians chapter 1 21 through 22 look at this it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ this is all the work of God you didn't do anything and you can't do anything to keep it he anointed us set his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit look at this in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. A seal of ownership is the word that means to make secure. He secures it. It's solid. It's secure. It's not going anywhere. It can't be lost. It's his. He guarantees. That means he makes the down payment, the pledge that all the whole thing is going to be paid off. He does that by how? How? The Spirit. In our hearts. That's the same thing he says in Romans 8, verse 16. The Spirit testifies with our spirit that we're children of God. Chapter, uh, for 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. Now it is God who made us for this very purpose, that we may be clothed in our heavenly dwelling. That's verse 4. And has given us the Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Same thing, a deposit guaranteeing Ephesians chapter 1 13 and 14 you were also included in Christ when you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation having believed you were marked in him with a seal the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory he seals us he guarantees us and he does that by coming to live in us and he confirms it to us in our hearts testifying in our spirit with us that we are God's children. That is a seal of the Holy Spirit, of his ownership, guaranteeing our inheritance. It's amazing. Lovely doctrine. Beautiful. Ephesians 4, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. That means when you sin and the Spirit's living in you, because he is, you grieve him. But don't grieve him with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Even though you grieve him because of your sin, he still seals you and he still confirms the testimony to you that you're, his, you're one of God's children. We're sealed, made secure again, same word. We receive the Holy Spirit as our assurance, our security, our guarantee, and we know it. Look at what John writes, 1 John 4, 13. We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. You know how you know you're saved? How do you know you're saved? According to 1 John. 
We know that we live in him and he in us. Why? Because he gave us his spirit. The spirit lives in us and the spirit confirms it to us. There is no wandering through life, wondering if you belong to God, if you're his child. The spirit gives you assurance. And I believe and I think that's better than anything else. Even though I do believe there are objective standards uh, for you to have assurance by a changed life, a growing in sanctification, maturing in Christ, those things will give you assurance too. But it's the Spirit speaking to your spirit, the Spirit in your heart giving you assurance. It's awesome. And if you're a child of God, you experience that too. It's the work of the Spirit. And the Spirit also even gives you the the will, the desire, and the power to obey. Look at what John says here. Chapter 3, 24. Those who obey his commands live in him. Just like in for, uh, chapter 4, we know that we live in him. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by his spirit, by the spirit he gave us. So the spirit comes to live in you to cause you to obey. All part of the same process of the Spirit giving you assurance of your salvation. See, Jesus didn't leave us orphans. He said, I will come to you. And he came to you to live in you. He came to you to dwell in you and to give you assurance of your sonship, of your adoption, of all the privileges and the inheritance that you're going to get. There's way more. I'm out of time. I'm praying and hope and beg that this is everyone's experience in my, who can hear me talking right now. I hope this is the way you experience your life regularly, systematically, constantly, hopefully daily. Just a regular pattern of Abba Father, a regular pattern of the Spirit confirming to you that you are a child of God. Because that's what Paul is saying in chapter 8. That's exactly what he's saying. And if you don't have that assurance... I'll be happy to spend some time and hang out with you and talk about it. We can, we can work through this. But I am out of time. I want to read verse 17 because we're not going to preach it today. I'm going to read it so you can have your, uh, whet your appetite for next week. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we also may also share in his glory. Romans, Romans 8 is the best chapter. So now you know why Martin Lloyd-Jones preached eight verses on verse 17. Eight sermons on verse 17. Pray with me. Father God, we do uh, come before you glad that you have given us your word grateful that you have inspired it and preserved it by the Spirit whom you gave us in Christ, that we may hear it, believe it, know it, that we may learn what you have done for us by your Spirit, giving us adoption, calling out Abba Father, uh, giving us assurance in our own souls, a certainty, a security, a seal, a guarantee that we're saved. I pray, God, that that'll be the truth, that, that that reality, that truth will be applied to everyone in this room today. No one will leave here not knowing Jesus Christ as Lord, as Savior, following Him, believing Him, trusting Him like a child. Father, we do love you and praise you for your grace to us today. Bless us. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.